Stop. You keep your plan if you want your doctor, you keep your doctor. The big news in France, where centrist Emmanuel Macron will be the next president of that country. I mean, it really, it's off the scale bonkers, this guy. The fact that he's got in kind of fills me with fear. As I sign a law that will ban sanctuary cities in Texas. Well, fired acting U.S. Attorney General Sally Gates set to testify at a Senate hearing on Russia's alleged election interference. Uh, Yesterday was actually the uh, Yay! Happy birthday! birthday. Wow, it's a kale cake. <laughs> so now you can endorse it fully. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Oz. This is really nice. I did not know you baked kale. The Lone Star State, Governor Tex of Texas, Governor Greg Abbott, is going to be joining us live. He sold the, signed the bill yesterday. I've had too much fun fighting this morning yeah. uh, regarding sanctuary cities. And Condoleezza Rice has got right. a great new book out. And I've just gotten conf uh, confirmation that uh, Team Condi has entered the building. Team Condi. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. They're, so they're all here, <laughs> ready to go from the Hoover Institute. They hit the road 3,000 miles. We finally have a chance to talk to the former Secretary of State Can't and National Security Advisor, who happens to be a Russian slash Soviet expert. There you go. We need you now. Indeed. In the meantime, you have to kind of be an expert to figure out what's going on on Capitol Hill regarding the American Health Care Act. And that's why we had Dr. Sapphire with us going through some of these some of the scare tactics you've heard from some of the political left over the weekend talking about how you know people are going to die and stuff like that uh reince priebus and paul ryan the speaker of the house were on yesterday and they were making it very clear look we've got to do something to save the american health care system because right now obamacare is collapsing here they are the law is collapsing it's not working you can't get health insurance in these places whether you have a pre-existing condition or not and so what we're trying to do here, George, is step in the front of this collapsing law and make sure that we can have a system that works, well, a system with choice and competition and affordable premiums. Making sure that if you have a pre-existing condition, this president is not going to let you down. We believe this is going to be a better product. We are not going to see the Obamacare system, which is failing and collapsing, continue any longer. We're going to do something better, and we're going to do our job as legislators to get this thing done. Why would the mainstream media, why wouldn't Democrats be so excited about that? He says we're going to provide a better product. The product that's out there now, it's failing. It's not going to work. It can't sustain itself. Insurance companies are dropping out left and right. Yeah, and, and here's the thing. There's not one Democrat that I know of, including the president, that ran on Obamacare. When he mm -hmm. went to go for re-election, he never said, uh, re-elect me because I came up with Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act, whatever you want to call it. Nancy Pelosi uh, lost, her, uh, lost her majority in the House and then eventually the Senate because of Obamacare. So there now it comes up, it, it's ready to die, and they're coming up with another program. The question is, is this revolutionary enough to change it? anything for the American health care system. Dr. Oz was here earlier and said, look, we're dancing on the edges. We have to worry. We got to control health care costs and make it more affordable, period. Listen. They're doing what they wanted to do, which is to make a big dent in how much you pay for health care. I would argue that the really brave move goes one step further and deals with the underlying cost issues. Because think about it, it takes twice exactly. as much yeah. to take care of each of us on this couch as it would if we lived in France or Germany. And we don't want to go live in France and Germany. We, we want to be Americans living in America, but not pay twice as much per person. Why are we paying people. twice? There's a lot of structural problems we have, but most importantly, I'll give this as a solution, we have technology in this country, because we're the leader, actually, in getting people to talk together digitally. We have technology that can dramatically cut our costs, more efficient prescription of medications. There are things we can do that helps pharma, the things that pharma can do to help the American public. Same for insurance, same for hospital costs, same for doctor fees. Across the board, we have a very inefficient Guys. system. Great ideas on how to save money going forward, but as we look at what's happening in uh, you know on television, we've got people who wanted to preserve Obamacare. They're using the same scare tactics they used years ago to pass Obamacare. Remember the the TV commercial where Paul Ryan's going to uh, shove Grandma off the off the cliff, and they ran that over and over, and it you know it impacted people. So now, just we should say that wasn't that wasn't Paul Ryan, and that was a stunt Grandma. But go ahead. <laughs> that wasn't it really? was not real it wasn't real yeah well wait that changes everything so are you telling me that the new argument that all these people are going to die if this thing that might not be true either look at that but not even sure <laughs> well but one of you, the things that democrats are doing this time is they're saying the reason that insurance companies are pulling out of iowa and are pulling out of uh, portions of tennessee and there are going to be big premium uh upticks in virginia and maryland is because of donald trump 
because Donald Trump has said, you know, I want to get rid of it. So there's uncertainty in the insurance market. And so they say that's why the insurance companies are pulling out. They're blaming Donald Trump, who has been talking about how it's imploding and it's a catastrophe. And, and by the years. way, this is why I don't dive into the 250 plus pages is because it's going to be totally redone in the Senate, whether it's going to be literally ripped up and started all over again or they're going to just fine tune. They're going to change it dramatically. Then we're going to have a brand new plan to debate. If you're looking at Senator Cass and Senator Collins, dramatically different than what Senator Cruz and Senator Obama want. In the end, I'm just wondering if there is an approach that would get Democrats involved so they can truly revamp the system and get the 60 votes. They're not revamping any system because they need 51 votes to do it uh, the way they're doing it now. If they do it a total revamp and a total replace, you're going to need 60 votes in the Senate. And not one Democrat they claim has even been asked to participate. Well, President Obama, he got an award yesterday. It's the 2017 Profile in Courage Award by Caroline Kennedy. And he was saying he had a plea to Congress. You know, this is his legacy, Obamacare. Mm -hmm. It's his legacy. He doesn't want this thing to go away. So he's pleading with Congress now saying you need to have the courage, because it's the Courage Award, to save this thing. Listen. In such moments, we need courage to stand up to hate. It doesn't take a lot of courage to aid those who are already powerful, but it does require some courage to champion the vulnerable and the sick. I hope they understand that courage means not simply doing what is politically expedient, but doing what they believe deep in their hearts is right. So there he was talking about how there's this effort on Capitol Hill and with his administration to dismantle his legacy. Interestingly enough, during the 30-minute speech there in Boston honoring President Kennedy, he never once mentioned by name President Trump. Right. But, you know, never one thing uh, Peter Gruber did, he brought up uh, uh, Jonathan Gruber. Peter Gruber is also a big Hollywood mogul Producer. who's uh, going to be part owner of an MLS franchise. So, he's Jonathan Jonathan Gruber. Gruber. Yeah. so Jonathan Gruber from the MIT architect. weighed in, who's one of the architects of Obamacare. Who called Wait. you stupid, remember? Right. Yeah, stupid meaning Oops. because you're an American. He said this about who's to blame because Obamacare is not working. Before President Trump was elected, there were no counties in America that did not have an insurer. Wait, you're going to blame the problems with Obamacare on President Trump? We had a situation under Obamacare where there was a one-time premium increase last year that made up for the fact that insurers massively underpriced in the first two years. And the problem was fixed. Then you have a president who comes in, undercuts open enrollment, doesn't, doesn't honor the obligations this law makes to insurers. All right. And as a result, premiums are going up and insurers are exiting. Look, the system as it is right now is not working well. And Republicans, it's their turn. The ball is in their court. They're going to try to fix it. But if you think that any Democrats in the Senate are going to help, it's just not going to happen because ultimately in Washington, it's all about political advantage. Things are so polarized. There won't be one single Democrat. But the big question is, how many Republicans will say, hey, that's just too far for me? Right. I think a lot. I, th I think a lot. They're seeing some of the blowback that happened yesterday and they're getting nervous. It's become nervous. so political. But if Democrats really look at this and they see that insurance companies are pulling out and it's failing and they care about the American people, wouldn't they say, let's get on board, let's fix this? We can they don't like the term, uh, repeal. they don't want to repeal Obamacare. They, they don't want to do that. Let's they want to fix it. Obamacare. Yeah. And that's the problem. It's all semantics, though, to me. To the American people, it's all semantics, don't you think? It's like what we have is not working. This is very new to our country. It's providing health care to everyone in our country. That's not a bad thing. Let's just fix it and make sure it's sustainable. Make it cheaper and make it better. And that's something we can all give up. Everybody get a stethoscope and treat yourself. Let's just do that. <laughs> that's what it's going to come down to. Let's do that. <laughs> Healthcare is too expensive. Buy a doctor kit. <laughs> Fisher Price, twenty nine ninety nine. Yeah, those are great. The Fisher Price ones. <laughs> I'm not a doctor, but I play one on TV. Yep. <laughs> right. All, All right. right. Jackie Vanyas has some headlines for us. Jackie, hey, do you guys remember breathing into that stethoscope as a kid? Yes. Care? Yes. Anyway, we're right. operation. We can buy operation. Yeah, we have a couple of those at our house. Uh, some headlines for you this morning. More provocation from North Korea. The rogue nation now detaining a four. American citizen. State media, they were accusing a professor of unspecified acts of hostility. Kim Hak Sang, now the second American teacher to be detained while working at a university in Pyongyang. The latest arrest makes four Americans detained in North Korea, including American tourist Otto Warmbrier, currently serving a 15 years hard labor. 
And a big day ahead on Capitol Hill. Fire acting U.S. Attorney General Sally Yates set to testify at a Senate hearing on Russia's alleged election interference. She's expected to recount her warnings to the White House regarding former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn's ties to Russia. This is the first time Yates is speaking publicly after being fired by President Trump for refusing to defend an executive order. And today, the trial set to begin for Betty Shelby, the Tulsa police officer accused of killing unarmed black man Terrence Crutcher at a traffic accident. Jurors will be asked if Officer Shelby went too far when she shot Terrence Crutcher last September. Shelby says Crutcher was acting erratically and appeared to reach for a gun. His autopsy came back positive for the drug PCP. Former homicide detective Rod Wheeler joined us earlier, saying this case will come down to one major thing. It's one thing to perceive something, and it's another thing for something to be reality. So was the threat that Officer Shelby perceived, was that reasonable in and of itself? And that's really what this case is going to come down to. Officer Shelby is facing first-degree manslaughter. TV movie and TV awards making sure viewers got a healthy dose of politics. Maxine Waters, the Democratic Congresswoman calling for President Trump's impeachment, getting a standing ovation before presenting the award for best fight against the system. That award going to the film Hidden Figures. MTV also getting politically correct with the first non-binary presenting the award for best actor. A non-binary is someone who doesn't use gender pronouns like he or she. That award going to Emma Watson for their role in Beauty and the Beast. And those are your headlines. Back to you guys. I think I'm standing underneath like an air vent. Isn't it freezing? It is. You're getting a little cold all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah. Shivering, totally shivering. Uh, I'm going to see if I can get that easily. fixed. We would I'm going to redirect it because it's cold Thank here. You. All right. Uh, Thank Jackie, you very much, Jackie. go get so, a sweater. Hey, uh, Ian, grab the flu. Just shut the flu. Okay? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, our next guest nearly lost her husband to a massive heart attack back in 2008. This morning she says that he wouldn't be here, here with her today, if they had to rely on Obamacare. And still to come, uh, former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice and Texas Governor Greg Abbott, both here live. Plus, we're celebrating National Pet Month with these adorable Aww. and adoptable dogs. <laughs> In 2008, before Obamacare was instituted, Washington Times online opinion editor Cheryl Chunley's husband, Doug, suffered a massive heart attack that put him in a 10-day coma and ICU. But thanks to around-the-clock care, he came out of it, a fate that Chunley says would never have happened under Obamacare. Here with her story is Washington Times online editor Cheryl Chunley. Cheryl, great to see you. Thanks for being with us. Ainsley, thank you so much. You're welcome. So tell us what happened to your husband and why you say if, if, your, if your family was insured under Obamacare, he would not be with us today. Uh, I'll try and be brief, but this was a very long ordeal. Uh, in 2008, as you said, I was at work and I got a call from my husband's boss saying that my husband had had a heart attack and had been transported to the hospital. When I went to that hospital, they were in process of airlifting him to another hospital, uh, and I had to go home and get our four kids, aged 13, 12, 6, and 1, to meet him there. Uh, during the flight, his potassium levels dropped and he went into a coma. And he stayed in that coma for 10 days, during which doctors and nurses, they had two teams working round the clock to save his life. His heart couldn't uh, get, his, his heart couldn't start get beating again. He actually had to have a balloon pump inserted uh, to keep the blood flow going and because of that he ended up having his leg amputated. Uh, there were several health problems after. There was a lot of surgeries after. He came finally out of the coma. Uh, no brain damage. All glory to God on that. Uh, yes. Perfectly healthy. But the thing is why I say he would have died if he had been on Obamacare at the time. We had top-notch private insurance provided through our employer. My husband's employer and the nurse that we met up with a few months later said that had we been on Medicaid or Medicare some kind of government run insurance program day three they would have pulled the plug they would have done a let and see uh, type of situation to see what could happen wow so that actually does happen and that would have happened under Obamacare she's saying 
Well, if Obamacare had been in effect at the time, it, it, would, it would have been a government-run program where they picked and, cho and uh, chose what to what, what to care cover. to give him. Mm -hmm. And she said that there was no way they would have provided the two teams of intensive care service around the clock. Wow. Even though pres the president at the time, President Obama, was, was calling these so-called private insurer insurance companies evil. Remember that? I do remember that, and that's the thing that has really nagged at my husband and I for years since Obamacare has gone into effect. Everything that Obama said was happening at the time didn't actually happen uh, with insurance until the passage of Obamacare. That's when we started getting our high deductibles, our, our co-pays that were out of the world. We couldn't choose the doctor. We had to switch medical providers. All that stuff happened after the fact. Wow. So the amputation, the helicopter ride to the hospital, the ambulances, the however many days, how many days was he in the hospital, did you say? Oh, he was in the hospital in a coma for 10 days, but then he had about 30 days total in the hospital. Wow. Then he had months of home health care. And, and I read you only had to pay $1,200? Twelve hundred dollars for the uh, the helicopter airlift. It was unbelievable. So and were things better then than they are now for our country? Oh, definitely better. Definitely better. Cheryl, Private market. I'm glad your husband's still with us and um, there to help you raise those four beautiful children. Thank you so much for being being with us and telling us your story. Thanks, Ainsley. You're welcome. Have a good one. All right, don't mess with Texas. Sanctuary cities now ban in the Lone Star State. And our next guest is the man who signed that controversial new law. Governor Greg Abbott's going to join us next. And another day, another Democrat desperate for attention and hurling a four-letter word. Is cussing the key to winning back American voters? All right, uh, time for some quick headlines on this Monday morning. A win in the war on terror for the Trump administration. The Pentagon just confirming the leader of ISIS in Afghanistan, Abdul Hasib, killed in last month's elite special forces operation. Two U.S. Army Rangers, Cameron Thomas and Joshua Rogers, also killed in that particular terror takedown. And it's the newest tool to stop truck bomb attacks, and apparently it's very effective. Watch this. There you got video showing the moment a truck is upended and obliterated in an anti-terror barrier test in Germany. The test driver was seriously hurt. The barriers being tested to stop future truck attacks like the one last year in Nice, France. All right, Brian. All right. Uh, hey, don't mess with Texas. Have you heard that before? Sanctuary cities now banned in the state after Governor Greg Abbott signed the bill into law overnight. Now, Governor Abbott joins us right now. Governor, what does this mean? Well, first of all, uh, I was proud last night to sign this law. This law effectively bans sanctuary cities in the state of Texas. What it means is that no county, no city, no governmental body in the state of Texas can adopt any policy uh, that provides sanctuary. Uh, second, what it means uh, is that uh, law enforcement officials such as sheriffs are going to be required to comply with ICE detainer request. What this law is going to do is to <clears throat> engender greater cooperation between local law enforcement and federal officials so that we ensure that everybody is going to be simply following the law. Now think about this, Brian. Isn't this quasi-insane? that we have to pass a law to force law enforcement officers to comply with the law. So give me an example of uh, complying. For example, if I pick somebody up and I'm a local sheriff, to, and if they are somebody that cannot provide any paperwork, do I now have to call ICE? No, sir. That is not what the law says. Uh, if someone is apprehended, taken to jail, what is done is a, a request is run through a computer system to find out whether or not there is an ICE detainer request pending. If there is, communication needs to be made with ICE. If there is not, nothing else happens other than the usual local law enforcement process. So if a sheriff or a mayor does not comply with what the governor says, you said they could face ramifications. What ramifications? Right. First, it, it, by them not complying, what that would mean is they have adopted a policy that promotes sanctuary city policies, which means that they would be not complying with the law. If they do uh, promote sanctuary city policies, 
what it means is they could be subject to jail time. It means they could be subject to being removed from office. It means that their city or county could be subject to fines and penalties of up to $25,000 per day. Wow. So here's what Sylvia Garcia says. She's a state senator. She says, quote, I'm afraid this legislation will lead to harassment and profiling of Latinos. And this is the last thing any of us would want. This bill would go from a broken taillight to a broken family to a broken faith in our system. Does she have legitimate concerns? Uh, it, that is nothing but wild rhetoric, this divorce from reality. First, remember this. Uh, and that is the people who are coming into the United States, especially across the border in Texas, are coming not just from Mexico. In fact, most of the people coming across the border in Texas are not from Mexico. They are from people around the entire globe. So this has nothing whatsoever to do uh, with those who are Hispanics, point one, point two. Most of the Hispanics who are in the state of Texas are here legally and they have absolutely nothing to worry about. Point three, uh, it is illegal for a law enforcement officer to racially profile anybody. And so if somebody does that, the, the law enforcement officer will be in a lot of trouble themselves. This is simply a mechanism such that when someone who has a criminal record who is wanted by ICE, uh, they're going to be held and detained and turned over to ICE. If you are here, uh, regardless of what your status, and you have not committed a crime mm -hmm. that makes you subject to an ICE detainer, you have no problems whatsoever. Got it. So the governor's doing what the president wanted the whole country to do, but right now it's been stuck in the court systems. You're not waiting for it to get unstuck. Governor Greg Abbott, thanks so much. Thank you. All right, uh, coming up straight ahead, Hillary Clinton is full of excuses for why she lost the 2016 election. But our next guest says the one the, that only means one thing. She's running in 2020, and she was Secretary of State during the start of the war on terror. So what advice would Condoleezza Rice offer President Trump? She actually started as a national security advisor. She joins us live next. Well, it is our great honor to have with us the former Secretary of State and author of a brand new book. It comes out tomorrow. It's called Democracy, Stories from the Long Road to Freedom. And Condoleezza Rice joins us live right now. Good morning to you. Pleasure to be with you. Uh, you know, um, Rex Tillerson, who now has your job, you're one of the people who suggested to Donald Trump that he consider him. What was it about that guy, the gas guy, that you thought, and you know, what he could fill my shoes? Well, first of all, he's a ter he was a terrific CEO, but he was an oil man. And oil people know the world like other people don't. They have to make long-tail investments in really difficult places. They have to deal with difficult people. Their people uh, are often working in very... Uh, harsh circumstances. Um, Senna sounds like Secretary of State. <laughs> and um, I really thought that uh, he and the President might uh, connect as business peers as well. Had they ever met before that? I, I don't think so, but I'm sure that uh, that then President-elect Trump knew of him. Everybody mm -hmm. knew of Rex Tillerson. He had a stellar reputation. And how is Rex Tillerson doing He's now? He's doing really well. He's doing really well. I think he has a very good relationship with the President, which by the way is the most important thing a Secretary of State can do is establish that relationship. He is speaking out. Uh, I thought he was brilliant, by the way, in mm -hmm. Moscow, when he said mm -hmm. that the Russians, uh, with the chemical weapons uh, ban that they'd supposedly gotten with Assad, he said they were either incompetent or they weren't telling the truth. I would never <laughs> have had the nerve to say that, but good for him. And he did have a one-on-one -on -one meeting, too, and Bob Gates also recommended him, I understand, That's with right. you to That's do that, right. so I think it went a long way. And you guys used to play golf together? We Is did. Right? We played you... golf together. They say all these deals happen tell on you, golf But course, also, right? including in the AT&T, you know, where you're a little nervous and you're trying to help each other out. So uh, Rex is a great person. One right. of three women accepted to be a member of Augusta National, That's which right. is a big deal. That's right. So important for the Secretary of Defense. You didn't have this to get along with the Secretary of State. Yeah. They seem to be getting along. In fact, I understand they meet to get on the same page even before they go to see the president. Absolutely. And I know Jim Mattis very well as well. He was at Hoover for a number of years uh, as a senior fellow there. Now, I did have a great relationship with, uh, particularly with Bob Gates. And 
and it matters a lot when the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense can say to all the people below them, look, don't try to bring about conflict between the two of us. We are going to work together. And then that message goes down through the entire government that the Secretary of State and Secretary and of State are working Defense together. Along. Exactly. Now, Vladimir Putin, very few yeah. people in this country know more about the Russians and Soviets than you. Did you predict when you met this deputy mayor standing in the corner, as you write in your book, that this guy would emerge as this dominant power for Russia and what has he done to that country? I did not and I didn't even when I first met him as president of Russia some number of years later when uh, the president President Bush and I met him in Slovenia I didn't think we would see what we have seen but we now know that he was harboring deep resentment about the end of the Cold War He's a former KGB officer he saw the collapse of the Soviet Union as he said as a tragedy and he really believes he is reestablishing Russian authority Russian influence in the world world. Unfortunately, if you have to take the territory of Ukraine to do it, well, so be it. And what you have to do with, uh, with Vladimir Putin, because he respects strength, he tries to intimidate. If you're not intimidated, he respects that. Mm -hmm. You have to establish the rules of the game. And the rules of the game are, we are not going to allow Russia to threaten our allies in the Baltic states or in Eastern Europe. We are never going to countenance the fact that they have taken uh, the territory of Ukraine. And if you establish those facts, and by the way, I also think what President Trump has done in rebuilding the American defense budget is sending a very strong message that America is back in the Should game. we send arms to the Ukrainians? Should we have instead of blankets and should we now? I would. I would arm the Ukrainians. I, I don't think you want to, you want to be very careful about how you arm uh, any group that is facing an insurgency. We sort of learned that lesson in Afghanistan when we found weapons on the other side. Right. But we should indeed arm the Ukrainians. Let them defend themselves. Since when is it a bad principle that people who are trying to defend themselves uh, don't have the sure. means? You to talk just... about finding in your book called Democracy, finding um, democratic openings in other yes. countries. When you have a totalitarian government that collapses, like what we've seen in Syria, right. is there a chance for democracy there? The hardest case is when a totalitarian regime is either overthrown or collapses because you don't have any institutions underneath. When you think about uh, totalitarian regimes, they control every aspect of life. Even in authoritarian regimes, you might have a little bit of civil society or maybe a free right. university here or there. Those are the hardest cases. And, and one of the things I really wanted to say with this book is don't think that all democracy promotion is like Iraq and Afghanistan. Those were the hardest cases where we went there for security reasons. We didn't overthrow Saddam Hussein to bring democracy. We did it because he was a security threat. Then we said the Iraqi people need a pathway to democracy. But those are the hardest cases. We've also helped Colombia to reclaim its future from the FARC. That was uh, an, a, an effort at democracy promotion. We helped Kenya after mm -hmm. a really bad election to right. find an answer. We when the, president, when the president told the president of Kenya, you need to step down. That's right. How'd that go over? Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> he did. Right. Sure. So I want to talk about where your book starts, and that's our constitution because yes. it's being debated again. As an African-American woman, do you see yourself in this constitution? Do you think that uh, when we look at nine of our first 12 presidents as slave owners, yes. should we start taking their statues down and saying, we're embarrassed by you. I am a, a firm believer in keep your history before you. And so I don't actually want to rename things that were named for slave owners. I want us to have to look at those names and recognize what they did and be able to tell our kids what they did and for them to have a sense of their own history. When you start wiping out your history, sanitizing your right. history to make you feel better, it's a bad thing. But let me just say one thing about our Constitution. That Constitution originally counted my ancestors as three-fifths of a man. Mm -hmm. And then in 1952, my father had trouble registering to vote in Birmingham, Alabama. And then in 2005, I stood in the Ben Franklin room, one of our founders. Mm -hmm. I took an oath of office to that same mm -hmm. constitution, and it was administered by a Jewish woman Supreme Court justice. That's the story of America. The long road to freedom has indeed been long. It's been sometimes violent. It's had many martyrs, but ultimately it has been Americans 
reclaiming those institutions for themselves and expanding the definition of we the people. Does it make you think less of, should we think less of George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and Andrew Jackson because they were slave owners? Well, they were people of their times. I wish they had been like John Adams, who did not believe in slavery. I wish they had been like Alexander Hamilton, who was uh, an immigrant, by the way, a, a child, a child of questionable parentage mm -hmm. uh, from the Caribbean. I wish all of them had been like that, and and Jefferson in particular. A lot of contradictions in Jefferson, but they were people of their times. And what we should celebrate is that from the Jeffersons and the Washingtons, the slave owners, look at where we are now. Sure, where we are now is we have a. a president by the name of Donald J. Trump. Yes. I know, you know, over the last couple of years, you, when he was running, maybe he wasn't your number one guy on the I list. Know. That's right. How's he doing now? Well, he's president, and uh, I respect the presidency. I respect <clears throat> anybody who gets elected to that office. Uh, and I think he is really starting to fill in the job. You know, it's hard. He's the first president in our history who had absolutely no experience in government of any kind. He's brought really excellent people in, great national security team, and you're starting to see him feel what the American presidency can do. When he said about those Syrian babies, I can't watch Syrian babies choking on chemical gas and not do something about it. That's the president of the United yeah. States speaking. We were talking earlier and uh, in the green room and you said you think he's getting a little more presidential. Well, I think he's really feeling the weight of that office. Uh, when you walk into the Oval Office and you've got Abraham Lincoln on the wall and he saved the country, uh, from the dissolution of the Civil War. And, and over there is George Washington, who, despite the fact that, his, that a third of his troops were down to smallpox, he managed to win the Revolutionary War. And then there is a Democrat, like Franklin Roosevelt, who uh, rallied the people to defeat Adolf Hitler. And so you feel the weight of that presidency. You're sitting behind Ro Roosevelt's desk. It, I, th I think you see it. And um, the American presidency is the most special institution in all of human history. And uh, the person who occupies it has to be about the presidency, not just about himself. Right. And do you, do you think that, uh, are you surprised that somebody, you saw President Bush, a lot of blowback on President Bush. Yeah. Are you surprised about the volume of pushback on this president? Well, it has been louder. Uh, than uh, any in my experience. And uh, maybe it's partly the fact that it was an unusual uh, election of someone who had not been in office. It came out of uh, a very important uh, moment in our history. Someone has called it, a friend of mine, the Do You Hear Me Now election. <laughs> People who felt that they were uh, not being served by their institutions. Mm -hmm. And so uh, perhaps it exposed some of the divisions in our country. And, you know, we all talk about divisions visions but let's let's remember and I hope what we'll get to is that America is an idea it is not nationality religion ethnicity it's an idea and that idea is you can come from humble circumstances and you can do great things because the founding fathers promised you life liberty and the pursuit of happiness and one reason that I wanted to write this book is I wanted Americans to start with our own story of struggle Absolutely. to make that right Hi. but then right. to recognize that we're at our best when we also stand for that for others. It That's can't true. be right. true for us and not story for them. That you were talking about taking the oath. Are you planning on running for president one day? Oh my goodness, no. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I, no. I do not have that DNA. <laughs> Did you, you gave it some thought, though. Well, doesn't everybody, but no. I ran for president of the Rice family, and that's good enough. <laughs> I, I won at age right. four. And you're doing great stuff at the Hoover Institute. This is an incredible book, Thank and you. I'll talk to you more about it on radio. You bet. In a short time. Congratulations. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rice. Thank you. Thanks very much. All right. Uh, straight ahead on this Monday, Hillary Clinton full of excuses for why she lost in November. I was on the way to winning until the combination of Jim Comey's letter on October 28th and Russian WikiLeaks. By saying that, our next guest says it could only mean one thing. She's running again in 2020. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, we're celebrating National Pet Month with these adorable and adoptable dogs. Brian, you need another one? No, Will Condoleezza Rice adopt a dog on television. It's never been done before. Well, 
Former First Lady Hillary Clinton full of excuses for why she lost in November. Watch. I was on the way to winning until the combination of Jim Comey's letter on October 28th and Russian WikiLeaks raised doubts in the minds of people who were inclined to vote for me but got scared off. Okay, that was her last week. Well, our, our next guest says her excuses only mean one thing. She's running for president again. Join us right now, Pulitzer Prize winning Collins Michael Goodwin. Where do you get she's running for president again out of that? Well, look, uh, Stevie, there's an old thing in politics that once you've been bitten by the presidential bug, there are only two cures, death or election. <laughs> and I, she's still alive, so she's running. Look, this new group she has formed called Onward Together, which right. sounds suspiciously like Forward Together, mm -hmm. uh, her old group, her election campaign group, uh, is very much about co-opting the Trump resistance. She's going to raise money to fund the resistance, she says. Now, that's going to give her an enormous amount of power and control over the resistance, right. over the money. And I think that right now the Democratic Party is demoralized and, div and divided, defeated across the country, state elections as well. They don't have a, a clear leader, and I think she very much wants to be the leader. And let, me, let me just take one more, one more point. Now, if she's the leader of the Democratic Party, do you think she's going to do this for Andrew Cuomo or Cory Booker's presidential no. campaign? Of right? course. So ultimately, I think she's setting herself up to be the 2020 nominee. But if she is the resistance, that that's, was her argument last time. I'm not Donald Trump. Elect right. me president. That didn't work out. That's, that's a very good point. And when you hear her make those comments about I would have won if it weren't for Comey, if it weren't for Russia, it's a very tired argument. And I think it, she's going to have to be a different person if she's going to win the election. And then you had Jen Psaki, who worked in the Obama White House, say over the weekend, uh, the perception of her was baked into the cake for about 10 years. Yeah. So it's like we we knew what she, she was going to be like when she ran. She ran. We got what we thought. We were and six be. months later, here she is again, repeating the argument as though, as you say, I'm not Donald Trump. Uh, look, the Democrats have, uh, are lost right now. They are continuing to make that same argument that she made. We're not Donald Trump. And it's getting them nowhere with the public. A recent poll shows 67% of Americans think the Democrats are out of touch with the country. Real quick, exit question. Who is the leader of the Democrats right now? Well, there, there is no one. I mean, you have Tom Perez running the Democratic well, National Committee. Well, then she should move right in. That's exactly it. There's no obvious candidate for 2020. There's no real leadership in the Senate. I mean, it's very much about following Bernie Sanders and mm -hmm. and the rabble. So there's no leadership in the party overall. I think I think she is aiming for that vacancy. All right. Michael Goodwin, thank you very much. He's My got pleasure. a great column on that at uh, NewYorkPost.com. Michael, yes. thank you very thank much. You. All right, straight ahead, we are celebrating National Pet Month with a pet fashion show. Good morning, everybody. I'm Bill Hemmer. Big hearing on Russia. President Trump already tweeting about that. We'll tell you what's going on there. House Republicans did something many did not think was possible. Now, health care heads of the Senate, what you need to know about the path forward. The military has taken out a leading ISIS commander, and a space flight is over after 700 days in orbit. Why so little is known about this mission? We'll see you in six minutes, top of the hour here on a Monday morning. See you then. May is going to the cats and the dogs. It is National Pet Month and joining us on the green carpet, we have five of our newest furry friends and they're all dressed up looking to be adopted. Yeah, by. joining us right now is Bill Zink. He's vice president of marketing for Chem Dry and Eric Ravid. He's public, he's director of public relations and content marketing for the Best Friends Animal Society. Welcome to you Good guys. Morning. Appreciate Thanks for having us. It. What's the here. message here today? What's the, question? What's the message here today? Well, Chem Dry and Best Friends have partnered up to help uh, support rescue pet adoption. And uh, Chem Dry is committed to, to donating $25,000 to Best Friends to support rescue pets and help them get more pets adopted and help more all pets have a healthy home. That's right. wonderful. All right, Eric, tell us what pets we have here. All right, Who's so uh, starting over here, we have Bentley, uh, and he is a pit bull terrier type dog. Hey, do and we want to see him walk the, the do, ring do we, carpet? Shannon, oh. do we want to have yes, Bentley walk? Yes, let's see him, because we got to get him a home. Now, he's a puppy, so he's got a lot of energy. Right. 
His name is Bentley. Bentley, just that. like the luxury car. Yes, that what is, is Bentley. What's on his face? And and Kendrick, uh, that's called a gentle leader, and it's just to help him uh, and not bite people. No, no, it's, yeah. it's actually not about biting. It's about more about the leash. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, it's more about the leash. So, and next we have Bre oh, um, so I don't even know the character. We have Wilbur the kitten. Wilbur the kitten. Wilbur, Wilbur is also oh, yeah. Wilbur. You can see Wilbur's pretty chill here with all the dogs this morning. Wait, so. who's walking who? <laughs> Thanks for roaming me. That's Wilbur. And next we have Bradley. I right. love Bradley. Bradley is sweet pea. What is seven years old and he's a Shih Tzu mix. Thanks. And Bill, when you talk about Chem Dry, you talk about all green, right? You're talking about green and being healthy for animals. Exactly. Chem Dry has green certified products. Uh, we're actually the world's largest carpet and upholstering service, but our mission is to use green products that are safe and healthy for pets and families. And if you have allergies, you remove all the allergens from the carpet. We do. And the our, our process removes 98% of allergens, which includes dog and cat dander. So that's an important thing for people who own pets. Right. All right. All right. Uh, more for uh, about Chem Dry and how you go with 25 thousand dollars in just a moment. Pets. Stay yep. with us.